And we're going to be looking at today, I will raise. And again, it says that Jesus brought honor to the Father in word and in deed. And so this week, uh, the big idea in our subject is basically believing. Believe. John wants us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. And so we looked at that last week where he was telling us, come and see. And so we, again, his main thing last week is we have to know and come and see for ourselves who Jesus, who God really are. We can't go by what our mothers, our fathers, our friends, our pastor, co-workers go. We have to come and see for ourselves. And so with that being said, that uh, we are just going to keep going through our lessons and studying and then following the Bible and putting our hearts in the right position to hear and see what God is warning us through his word, through his deed, through what's going on in the world today. So uh, I think uh, our book at the beginning it's talking about uh, on page 28. It fir first says, that question right there says, what sign stands out to you when driving on a highway? And then how does those signs help you make decisions along the way? And so I think this highway metaphor is real good because, uh, you know, when we're going down the road driving, we have a lot of things that we have to worry about. Like if it's a long trip, we have to worry about not only gas, we have to worry about resting, we have to worry about food, we have to worry about lodging. And so we have to be paying attention to the road signs. And so those are some of the signs that I pay attention to when I'm driving. And they help me make a decision on how much longer I should drive, when, I sh when can I get my next break, uh, and so on, you know. And so that's how I did that on the roadside things. Anyone have anything they wanted to say about those road signs and how they affect the decisions you made on, 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 on your travel? Yeah, I do, the same, I do the same thing as far as um, watching the signs to tell you how far you have to go. Like if you're going from here to, to Annapolis, it might say, or let's say North Carolina, Raleigh, 120 miles. I might see the first sign, and then I won't read any more for maybe two or three more signs just so I kind of psych myself out. So I'm not constantly counting down every step or every mile that I'm going. And also I kind of noticed that red sign also in that it tells me how far I've gone or how much long I have to go before I can take a break. So go ahead, Ms. Rowena. Oh, no. Um, they can be confusing, some of them, too. Um, I have gotten really messed up on especially uh, 495, the mixing bowl and all of that. It used to be. <laughs> but I thought about... Uh, back in the day, uh, traveling with my husband uh, in the military, and we didn't have the GPS and all that stuff. And uh, I, I always read the maps and uh, kind of looking out for signs. And uh, we didn't have as many signs now today to when you're going across country to uh, help you. So, you know, there were times uh, without the signs, we, we went off the beaten path and, and had to try to get back on. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, uh, they, are, they are helpful today. Amen. Very good. So we can go on and on with signs, but today's lesson, we're going to be talking about some signs 
and so what Jesus was doing. And so our subject is starting off with a wedding feast under understanding the text. But again, this week, again, as you see that question on page 29, it says, as you read John 2, 11 to 23, underline details that might seem symbolic in nature. What was John trying to communicate with the details he included? Now, on this word, I would like, again, this week, I would like you all to get a pencil and a paper again. And uh, this week, we're going to not have four columns, but we're going to have two columns. And the two columns are going to be on the left. We would like to put at the top of that column 22. Then, like in the past, then. And then on the right column, I want you to put 2022. And that will say now. And so what you're doing is going to say, okay, this sign of the wedding feast that we're going to talk about this morning. The first thing we see in this sign is that uh, Jesus turned the wine the water into wine. So we're, here we have Jesus at a feast, right, and uh, a, a, a celebration. So in those days, they were looking for signs of the Messiah, right? And so this wedding feast is our first miracle sign that Jesus was showing his disciples of who he was. So that's where we're going to start off, and that's the direction I'm trying to carry you with these signs. Now, then, on the other hand, when we answer the question of the example of what was the sign really represent, what was the wine really representing? Back in those days, it represented this feast was representing um, they were having a celebration. They ran out of the wine. <laughs> Okay, and so what happens is Mary comes to her son and asks him to, uh, they're running out of wine. And so Jesus is on his mission doing his things, and he's like, hey, what's that got to do with me? You know, you know they're having a good time and everything, but then she had faith in him, her son, because what did she do? She told the folks, hey, Whatever he asks you to do, go ahead and do it, right? So mm. here we are with this. So now he goes and he, you know, we know the story how they put the fill the bottles up. He turned it to wine. And then the host of the thing says, hey, you save your best for last. Am I right? That's what it says. We're going along with it. So I look at that in our context of what the wine was representing the wine that Jesus made versus the wine that they had was that Jesus, the, the old wine, represented the law of Moses, and it, it, it represented the old covenant and the old uh, testament. And so that was what he used that for. And then, and now, what the new wine that he made represented that, hey, my new covenant is better than the old one that couldn't save you. Now we're under grace and all those things. So the wine and those, those things, and he, what he's saying with the wine is Jesus is better than what you had before. What you had before Jesus is not good as what you have now in me that he made for them. And so it pointing to his new covenant a little take on that. So now if we go on to our first section of our book here, it says, Glory Shown, right? And that's on page 30, and it says we're going to read John chapter 2, verses 11 
and 12, verses 11 and 12. And it reads like this. It says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Canaan of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there only a few days. Lord, add a blessing to the hearing, the doing, and the reading of his word. So now, here we are in the first section of our lesson today, Glory Shown. And uh, the first thing is the, the sign, the first of his signs had already passed. We already talked about that. They were at the, mirror, the, the feast. And the reason of this sign was to, it says right there, to reveal his glory and his disciples believed in him. And so that takes me to right underneath you see he said he did seven signs down there. And did you know Jesus did seven signs, but we're only going to talk about the one which is in uh, our section that we're reading about today, which is in 2.11, 1 through 11. And so with this being said, the sign um, that he did here for him, them to believe, we look back on our scripture in John 20 and uh, verses 30 and 31. And those uh, state out that the reason why in John 20 and chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31 read like this, the purpose of John's gospel and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing in ye might have life through his name. So, like again, he wasn't doing things just for a hocus pocus around to show how great he was doing these things for that these folks can believe. And you remember right now, his disciples at this time back then, under our 22 column, they were new. They were babes in Christ, right? He had just called them. He was, you know, he had just called them. They were still looking for all this the Messiah under the Old Testament, he had just recruited them from John, some of them, and he had found some of the other ones. And they were all like, just look at that now. We have to look at that in the past, how they were, a lot of folks would have been skeptical about this guy, but he used these signs to show who he really was. He wasn't just like trying to abuse his power, more or less, I'm trying to say. He was doing it for a purpose. And so now what I wanted to do is look at how him doing that with these disciples, now let's look at it today in 2022. As we look back on that, and we know that we are under the grace of God because the Messiah has arrived, right? And he has died. He's been on the cross. He's risen. And now he's promising to return in Revelations, right? So uh, how then I wanted to put it that column. We have to pay, pay attention to that. We're paying attention. We're not like these people down there that were skeptical, non-believing and everything. We have to make sure that we're looking at our world around us, what we're doing. So I think our question on this whole thing is, how does Jesus revealing his glory to us today? you know, in our column over here. Now, back then, you know, he revealed it by these signs and wonders. But now, how is he revealing it in 2022? Anyone want to tackle that? One is through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Very good. Holy Spirit. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, he also revealed his. Uh, are we on the question? Yeah. yeah. In his creation. Mm hmm. Okay. What about 
believers. That's believers. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy. We can look at, you know, he helps us when we're in times of need and he comes to all this. But the best thing, I think, going to be cool. What was that? Oh, but I think through Jesus Christ, we have salvation. That's a sign, right? And then we have that he have, He forgives our sins. Right? Through his word. Oh, I'm getting a routine. So anyway, um, those are some of the signs that, that we have right now. Anyone else? How he reveals signs to us today? The repentant sinners, you know. You know, some people look look at you, look at some folks, and you say, there's no hope for them. They just wretched, you know, and then God can miraculously save them. You know. Um, Excuse me, Brother Joe. Yes. Uh, we have some background. I think no. everybody got their speakers on. And then, yeah, we all, everybody got too many speakers on, and we're getting a lot of feedback. No. But so I, I would say, and in short, that he reveals himself through um, uh, creative, as somebody mentioned, and redemptive acts. Creative act was so that they could see. And the redemptive acts were, uh, like, what has already been mentioned through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I think, too, Brother Joe, uh, at that time, they didn't have the full gospel. Today, we have the full gospel, and it's being preached um, around the world, actually. So, the revelation of the written word through Jesus that was the incarnate word we have the full gospel these days that's one way that's right and then you know that in that time he was like giving them the sign But like today, he reveals to us. I really main thing for that we can be forgiven for sin, and, and that we can have eternity with him by repentance. You know, and that's a glorious thing right there. Our Bible tells us that like we were lost, we were dead in sins and trespasses. But hey, turn to God, turn to Jesus, and guess what? We transition from. Uh, a, de- a life that led to death to a life that leads to life. You know, and I think that's a great sign that we have here that we can read about there in our Bible. And so, but they didn't have that back then. They were under law, and the law couldn't save them. They had to go to the temple and follow all those different things. And then, of course, uh, the signs that they had back then, too. They were missing them, a lot of them, because uh, Jesus, they were all, all, all back in the thing. Isaiah, all of them were pointing folks, what? Isaiah 53, or I think it was, where they were saying that, hey, he's going to be born. A child is going to be done. He's going to grow up. He's going to establish a new kingdom, everything. They were looking for these things, but they weren't ready for this carpenter's son, more or less, what gives him all this authority and power to know all these different things. And then when they did see him, they wanted him to prove himself to them, you know, because they're distrusting him. But he was like, no, I'm doing this for these guys right here so they can believe and know who I am. And he revealed him, and they're going to have life eternal. So that's on the first subject of glory shown. So we'll go to the next one, which is worship expected. 
And that's going to be in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, which reads, The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling ox, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. 16. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it was is written, zeal for your father for your father's house will consume you. Lord, add a blessing to the hearing and the reading and of his word. So worship expected. And again, they're talking about getting ready, the Jewish Passover. And so, again, I want to rest here in our column, and I want to put the Passover in the 22 column and also what it meant back then to them. It represented what the children of Israel being passed over and this was a feast that they had and they came to represent that with the blood over the doorposts and all that. Okay, now in 2022, Passover represents Jesus, the slain lamb that was on the cross for our sin, right? His blood cleansed it for us. So with that being done, he's risen, right? And so of the cross, the blood of the cross. That's what I'm saying. And then we look at where they were going to. When he went up to Jerusalem, and he was what? He went into the temple. And now the temple, in our column on the left-hand side in the old days, was the temple where you went to worship God, and to the priest would go in and make your offering and your sacrifice, right, for your sins and everything for your family. And that's what the temple represented in the Old Testament. Now we look at temple in the New Testament. Our New Testament say our temple is we worship, uh, as we say, the body of the temple, you know, is uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, dwells in the temple now, which we have dwelling in us, because it says that our body now is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to look at, how now he goes to the temple in the whole old oh, there now what they're doing in there what they're doing at that day what were they doing in the temple look what it say they were uh selling oxen sheep and doves now they were turning this into uh a merchant place and and he found money changers in there too see what this is doing people are coming to the temple they're trying to worship but guess what they got this distractions in there, selling sheep, doing this, doing that. So now when we go to today's time and we talk about the temple, guess what? You know, you know, are we, uh, do we got stuff distracting us from our worship with the God? You know, I mean, are we doing some immoral things out there? Are we selling things, you know, for, uh, you know, to try to, uh, that's, that's distracting us from, being where we're supposed to be at with God. You know, there's things, I'm sure there's things, you've seen things in churches that distract you when you're trying to worship God and everything. We go there to worship him in the church, but that's still, you know, we need to get together, but we, again, again, we got to remember the inside job too. You know, we can see each other on Sunday in church as we get together to worship God, but guess what? That's not the end of it all. The end of it all is really you carrying this God spirit with you around 24 hours a day. So now all these lessons are signs for us to make sure that we are not like these people around in those days are money changer. Are we doing those kind of things when we're trying to, with our temple that we're doing? Am, am I trusting God or am I trusting my lottery ticket? You know what I'm saying? And different things like that. Or, or, or am I perverting? my temple? Am I doing unclean things with my temple? You know, and so this is what they were doing there. Now, don't get me wrong, he wasn't condemning them for doing 
selling a service and providing the convenience for these people who travel long distances. These people had traveled long distances. And hey, you know you do the same thing too. It's easier to stop past uh, Popeyes or some McDonald's or whatever and pick up your little something to rather than go home and cook that little stuff right there. But then again, what I'm trying to point out is they, they were inside the temple doing this, distracting people. It's okay to sell merchandise and make it convenient for everyone who wants to come work and have their sacrifice right there. But like, uh, we don't want it inside messing up ones distracting from the true worship that God wants us to have with him. And so he went on with that. He chased them on out of there, turned their tables over. And then we have to remember, just like Jesus said, he had the zeal for what? The father's house. And we, as our temple, we have to make sure that, hey, I can come on Sunday and put my good stuff on and, and shout and clap and dance and sing and listen to a good sermon. But then after I leave and I get in the parking lot and you back too close to my car, what I say? <laughs> you know, so we got to carry it outside the doors as well, right? So then we come down to, uh, so I, I would like, you know, to come down. We got two questions in this section right here, right? The first one is, what are some of the ways people show disregard for worship today? You know, maybe I'll get you started off. Is it lack of humility? Uh, what about a blemish offering, you know? Well, I said people show disregard for worship today when their talent or ability brings more attention to them than to Jesus. People show disregard for worship today when their worship is more about what they want to receive from Jesus rather than focusing on him. Very good. Telling to honor Jesus in God. Mm -hmm. and bringing focus on themselves you know uh, I've been thinking about Psalms 1 a lot today it's like blessed is the man in the counsel of the ungodly and I look at that because you notice he's blessed because of what he's done it's not that he say bless me Lord and I'll walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, but he's blessed because he's already done it. So I think it's proper, proper context in the proper way to do things. And when we don't do it, and we bring, uh, like Fred said, you know, bringing attention to ourselves and, and, and all those kind of things and not in a humble and a true worship spirit. You know, I think that's, uh, this, you know, answers that question about uh, disregard for worship. Anyone else on this one before we go to the next one? Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I think this, this word worship, uh, we've got worship service and then we've got worship. Uh, referring to worship service, there's things that go on within our our churches uh, in reference to the proper order, the music, music directors, and all these things. That's the worship service. Uh, a lot of times we don't get along in those situations, and we bring the world to the church. The worship of God. And that's where that word comes from, word ship. You might be too close to your mic. Yeah, good, because we're getting a lot of static. Now, I can't hear you at all now. Can you hear me now? No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. 
No, no. You disappear. You're in and out. Is his wife in the same room with you? Huh? Why can't he? What you saying? I said, is his wife in the same room with him? Because their mics were conflicted as they were. No. Oh, I, no, she's no. not in the same room. Okay. That causes me that. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, you were in and out. You said uh, you said you're gonna pass. Okay, because you said I uh, okay. So, well, let's go to the. Uh, uh brother Joe. Yes. I would like to add, add to that. Um, in this regard, uh, I worship today. Mm -hmm. as, as a believer, I get up on Sunday morning. Sun is shining real bright. The weather's nice outside. So I said, oh, man, this is such a beautiful day. I don't think I'll go to church today. I think I'm going to go and wash and polish my car. Mm -hmm. I, I have disregarded. I know where I should be, mm -hmm. but I pass over that to take care of material things like polishing my car. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think... Uh Mr. Allen was right on the right track. It's like, you know, we go in there and we have a service of worship, but I, again, we have to really inside be coming in, even though we have the, uh, a lot of folks going around doing different things, we still in ourselves have to be thanking God for, like you just said, this sunny day and this great health, and this home, and all those sins that I've done in the past that have been forgiven. Hey, all those sins in the future that I'm going to do are, can be forgiven. And I'm like, I'm going to let God know that I appreciate Jesus. I appreciate being saved from all this sinful world through my faith and his faithfulness to even seek me out and bring me into Believing in his son. And so that's what true worship is got to be all about. It's thanking God for his mighty great deeds of grace and mercy that he done and shared not only on me, but everybody else who wants to accept what. And that's something that, I mean, you know, that you have to do. So then we go to... If no one else, we'll go to 34. One other, one, other, one other thing that we bypass on worship, and we see it going on now, uh, uh, coming to uh, worship, uh, and as he distinguished between the service and worshiping God, but uh, coming in for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, there are some people who come saying they come in to worship but they are is politics uh and also uh trying to uh get their little business going uh, mm -hmm. and um we feed into that uh because we see maybe we might see a politician or somebody come into the church and mine has completely gone off of worship. Amen. Yeah. I think so. Uh, what I was say a minute ago, Joe. Uh, can you hear me now? Go ahead. You in and out, but we listen real close. I have written here, God loves us and has chosen us as his own special people. So, be gentle, kind, humble, meek, and patient. Put up with others. Forgive everyone who has wrong. Now, this, this would be the fruit of the Spirit. But I also want to put the case in worship in general 24 7. Um, the celebration of God's supreme worth in such a manner that God's worthiness becomes 
separation of human life. We are to live uh, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, patience, weakness. Uh, uh, the roadway we have to have is our worship service on Sunday and we have to conduct ourselves the same way for worship service that we do when we leave and go for the other six days of the week Amen I, I would like to add uh, something to that uh, you know mm-hmm. there was a scripture um, and I have to look it up it was in uh John 4, so further along in the book, John 4, 24, which says, you know, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So mm-hmm. it kind of dovetails to what um, Brother Allen just said, you know, about, you know, that, that worship, that has to come with you know, that spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit, what my mother said about the Holy Spirit, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I don't. I, you know, I can't get the best explanation for what all that entails, but I know that's what the word is. Okay, thank you. What is going on today? Everybody's mic is acting silly. It's for everybody. But look in that blue box on page thirty-three, and it says, "Read Psalms sixty-nine-nine," and then, our, if you read the whole thing. It says at the end, it says, how does reading Psalm 69 give a deeper understanding of the events taking place in John 2? Basically, it's talking about praising God with singing, magnifying God with thanksgiving. This pleases the Lord better than, guess what, those oxen sacrifice, those bull sacrifices. And he also says, seek him be humble, seek God with your whole heart. See, so now all this stuff, magnifying God, that's worshiping him, right? Uh, thanking him, that's worshiping him, right? Pleasing him with doing those things is better than even in the Old Testament. to say, hey, obedience is better than sacrifice. Doing these things, he said right here in 69, verse uh, Psalm 69, verse 31, this pleases the Lord better than oxen. And then in verse 32, in Psalm 69, it says, be humble and seek God with your heart. See, and this is, I'm thinking, is the ideal but that lead us what John is trying to tell us right now. What he's pointing out to these folks, you know, they brought all this stuff in there, you know, but all that stuff is like, hey, if you're going to worship him, that's where we are right now and today in our 2022 side of our column is like when we come in to God, we don't, the sacrifice has been made by Jesus Christ. Now we have to come in here with what it's saying right here. That's why we say we got this thing in the Old Testament they might not have had the song, but they had the law and all that stuff, and they have to follow these rituals and go to the temple and worship him now. But we can worship him 24-7 while we're walking down the street praying. Like Brother Allen said, you know, you can carry that with you 24-7, not just in when I go to First Baptist Church in a few minutes and I come over there again, you know, in false worship. I can do it like this, too. I go over there. I'm working the audio video stuff, and I want everybody to see me. Out. So I'm going to run up there and put some mics and make everything look good, trying, like Freddie said, trying to bring attention to myself. No. The whole thing is to point people to God. Jesus used these signs to point people to who he really was, the Messiah. So now in 2022, we have to make sure that what we're doing is pointing people to that uh, return of Jesus Christ. Are we ready? Are we looking at the signs pointing us to his return right now? We're going to talk about some of those things in the next section, about 2022, what we're going to be looking at. But the other question on page 34 is this. How does proper worship help us 
maintain a right relationship with God. Huh? Proper work, maintaining a right relationship. Come on, saints, what y'all got to say about that? Proper worship. Your first half of Go ahead. I didn't hear you, but I know you're trying to say something. It's real hard today. This audio, this technology ain't messing with us today. Proper worship would mean that you have to start. You have to start with what now? Being in God's will. Being in God's will. Okay. That's proper worship. That's what it starts with. Come on, what else? Right relationship. The right relationship, it says it right there, being in his God will. And so see, then that's the same thing too. Remember, these guys uh, had the oxen, they had the sheep, they had the doves, but guess what? They weren't in the proper place with it. You know, you can have all the great intentions you want. You can have all the great ideas you want. And they could be right. But it's a proper time to do it. Remember well, last week when Jesus came and what happened? Those guys from John followers saw the real Messiah. What did they do? Did they cling to John? No. They went to the Messiah because they wanted to do things properly. You know, and they were in the right place to when he came and they were able to recognize their eyes was open and they followed him. But now look, they still babes now. They don't know everything. That's why he got to give them these signs and everything to get them on the right track. You know, he's training them up. He's training them up. So anyone else on how proper worship helps us maintain a right relationship with God? In a proper proper worship helps us maintain a right relationship with God by remembering who God is and what he has done for us. Proper worship also reminds us of how holy God is, how mighty and how wonderful he is. Amen. Also, proper worship, uh, we bring him glory through adoration, thanksgiving, praise, reverence for him. And uh, being in the right relationship uh, for proper worship, worship uh, humility, submission, and obedience. Um, and uh, as we seek to worship God, uh, it brings about our confession first from our sins because God is holy. And so when we come before him, you know, uh, we, we have to ask forgiveness first so that uh, we can uh, come to our holy God who, you know, uh, without uh, sin in our heart and bitterness or anger toward others. So in being in the right relationship uh, with God through um, submission and humility and all will put us in right re relationship with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and through the Holy Spirit, his presence is revealed in us. Now here's one of the subtle things that a lot of us, it's real subtle, watch this, Jesus' zeal for properly honoring of the temple of God consumed him. With, now just subtle, just think, he didn't want nothing in that temple that was going to distract or displace or put anything in the way of him worshiping or honoring his father God and so why I say that's subtle because let's look at it uh, 
You know, we got multimedia now. We got television. We got all this stuff going on. Now, we carrying this temple around with us, this Holy Spirit around with us. Now, what are we putting into it? You know, we got to be very careful of what we click on on that Internet. We got to be very careful of what we look at on that television screen. Because some of the, and we got, and of course, we got to be very careful of some of the things that we, how we approach and how we criticize and talk to other folk as well. So it's very, it's a lot of things for proper worship, not only jumping up and down, clapping and hitting our tambourine and things like that. It's way more to that dancing, singing, you know, it's way more. We have to constantly be on the guard. Is God, remember the old saying, what would Jesus do? What, what about, does this please Jesus, what we're doing? That's worship. If we worship and if we take the time to think before we do anything, is this going to please God? Is this going to defile my temple, my relationship? So anyway, anyone else on that question? Uh, we go brother, on? I had a thought. Uh-huh. Uh, now that, uh, you know, things have changed so much within these two years regarding uh, uh, worship service, uh, whereas a lot of people aren't able to worship, uh, you know, in the church building mm -hmm. ever over the Internet. Um, I think that, and I know for myself, uh, we have to be, uh, we have to be in an attitude of worship, and as you says, we do it every day, and then when we come, say, in the worship service on Sunday over the Internet, um, that is a, a challenging thing, I would say, uh, for a lot of people uh, with distractions and things in the home that's going on in the home. So I think that we have to prepare ourselves when we are, uh, say, uh, uh, in worship service and worshiping God, uh, have, you know, a designated quiet place and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's a whole different thing today. And thank think, God for it because many people sick and afflicted and all can't get, you know, out or anything, mm -hmm. but we have to be so careful at home That's with right. the distractions. That's right. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, uh, yeah, we get the worship service and, like, there's distractions going on in our home that break us away. But guess what? Uh, we can take that message, like we write in these notes now, we can take this message and we can sit and take it to our quiet place. See what I'm saying? If we take it to our quiet place where we don't have our distractions. Uh-huh. Right. Very good. Anyone else? If not, we're going to go to signs and get ready to close on out. And here's how it reads. Sign remembered. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 25 reads, So the Jews replied to him, What sign will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, This temple took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? 21. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. 23, while he was in Jerusalem during the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So now the signs remember. And so this comes in and like... Uh, you know, you know, again, you know, 
back to John 20, 20, he did all these things, 20, I'm sorry, 30, chapter 20, 30. He did all these for they would believe, you know, but, and then once he did these signs, in those days, these people, like the Jews, replied, hey, we want a sign, you know, and then, you know, I think Isaiah 42, 6 says that people, man, are always looking for a sign, you know, and so, but then, you know, I don't know, let me get that and make sure I'm saying that right. Uh, Isaiah 42, 6. Uh, Isaiah, here's Isaiah. Hold on. 42, 6 says, and the Lord has called thee to in righteousness and will thy hand and will keep thee and give thee of the people and the light of the Gentiles. Okay, well, I might have had that wrong. Is that 42? Maybe my notes is wrong. Through 8. Okay, let's see. And then it says, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prisons, and that they will sit in darkness and out of the prison house. I am the Lord that is my name, and my glory will be given to anyone, neither my praise to a graven image. Oh well. Well, it was a good thought, but I don't. I I can't tie that over. I got it written down here for some reason. But Lord, brought a blessing to the reading of those scriptures. Now uh, the signs. Remember, so first he's telling them about the temple, right? And he's gonna. They want to say, hey, the Jewish people say, hey, what sign can you give us? You know. And then, uh, you know, he's saying, hey, he's going to destroy the temple in three days and raise it, you know. And, of course, they come to reality now. This is after a while later, after his death and everything. They, they've taken us up a little bit farther where the disciples came into remembrance after his death that he had made this statement about him dying and being raised in three days. And they realized that he was talking about his body. And so then, and then when they remembered it, now they starting to mature in the things that Jesus was trying to show them, you know, by all those things, how he, they had said that about, you know, he was going to speak into the temple, where he was temple, and what he's saying with the temple thing, in the old, again, we had that two columns, the old temple where you went in and you sacrificed these oxes and rams and everything. Now he's going to replace that with this, uh, not a temple built with man's hand, but like, uh, you know, it's going to be the temple that through the grace of God and the blood of Jesus. Sister Graham was talking about uh, earlier about the distractions, how people are on... Um, online doing this service and everything but you look at now that like uh we looking at the signs of like we as believers now in 2022 have seen these signs of old in the bible and now we've seen some more stuff that they didn't even see we've seen jesus come and we, well you know he's came and he's died and he prepared a place for us up there and, and revelations tells us that uh you know in the days when it's getting time for Jesus' return, which is what we are looking for as the day of Jesus' return. I know I'm looking forward to being in glory forever and ever and ever, so I'm trying to keep my eyes focused on um, what's the signs that are Jesus' return. Am I ready? I'm ready. Am I trying to get ready, or am I already ready for when he returns? But we look at some of the things in our world that tells us how close we are to it. We look at pandemic all over the place. We're looking at 9-11. You know, look at how many people went flying back to the Lord when 9-11 happened. You know, these things lead us back to trying to get right with God and making sure we make sure that we stay focused on him. Look at, look at our society or all these are signs of, that it's saying all this is in the Bible that's going on right now and so the point on these next two questions is this 
What was the significance of Jesus pointing to the temple as a metaphor for his resurrected body? The place of worship changed, right? From a building. And then, I think at this point, I would like you to look at your front cover of your book. And you see that sign right there? What does it say? What that sign say? One on the front way. Of, hey, one hey way. that's the temple. You know, there's only one way to God. And so, Jesus Christ is that way. And so, again, back to this question, what is the significance of Jesus pointing to the temple as a metaphor for his resurrected body? What does he Jesus say? I way. am what? Go ahead. Uh -huh. Go ahead, uh, Fred. He... Jesus uses the temple as a metaphor for his resurrected body was to show that the temple system would be obsolete. Rituals would no longer be necessary and that the new system would be by faith and grace through Jesus Christ, through him. The one way. Go ahead, and Sister I Brown. also said uh, that he was superior. He, it shows that he was superior over the building where the Jews worshipped. And at his death, the veil of the temple was torn, mm -hmm. Matthew twenty-seven fifty-one, mm -hmm. showing that Jesus, as we mentioned, was the new way into God's presence. Mm -hmm. Now they will worship him, we will worship him in spirit and in truth, John four twenty-one. 21. Uh, believers are God's new temple under the Holy Spirit that mm. dwells in us. 1 Corinthians six eighteen through 20. Very good. Now let's go to the next question because we're running out of time. And uh, it says, how does the resurrection serve as a sign of Jesus' glory and authority? I would say that the resurrection serves as a sign of Jesus' glory and authority because it showed that death could not keep him in the grave. He had the power to come out of that grave and rise and go up to heaven. And that's why we got the benefit. Amen. Anyone else? Yep. His power over death. So, and also, we don't have to serve no more... Uh, carving images or anything like that. That's where I had that Isaiah 42, 8 coming from earlier. From earlier. Yeah, so we don't have to worry about that. That's glorified, shows his glory. And so, let's apply the text and then we'll be done. Um, believers should see Jesus work in event the small to even the small things right mm -hmm. we should see Jesus working in even the small things number two Jesus believers or believers must worship God in, in spirit and in truth believers should worship Jesus as the son of God So again, thanking you all for coming. Any last comments before we close out? Okay, then, let's pray. Good Lord, thank you for another day. Thank you for the faithful that came, and thank you for those who will see this online or that you cannot have them distracted and they can really get some meaning to where they can truly uh, truly have uh, a walk a right walk with you in word 
And then, Father, also, and in their deeds, Father God, that we can all take these things and move on and truly worship you and your Son through the guidance of your Holy Spirit, Father God, that our compass that points us into the right direction to go. So, Father, we just, again, thank you for another day that you've given us, and uh, we pray that... uh, We can walk worthy, and we pray that we can find someone to tell the good news that the one way is Jesus Christ, the Lord, Savior, and that he will uh, forgive, we can repent, we have a pure heart and pure worship, that we have a heavenly home with him and the Father. So thank you, Lord, again. Be with us as we move on from here, but never from your presence. Amen. 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 All right. Enjoy it, Brother Girl and family. Thank you all. Okay, Charlene, I'll be heading that way in a minute. Thank you, Mr. Joe. I guess our technology wouldn't let nobody hardly speak today. Everybody's mic was cracking and acting up. I guess everybody in the world was on, on, on the line today. Maybe that's what it was. It's a, it's a cold day outside a lot of places in the world. I guess they was up there. But we thank you for your input and your faithfulness. And mm-hmm. uh, we look forward to doing it again next week. All and right. uh, maybe our technology will be a little bit better. You will find. Peace and health. Come on, computer. Let me go. Okay, I'm the last one here. My computer don't want to let me go home. Leaving. Hello? Hello?